This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. This podcast is sponsored by the sour beer drinking folks at Fooder Crafters. They make fooders specifically for breweries and love every brewer they have ever met. Fooder Crafters would like to say thank you to all the good people in this industry. Cheers. Hey everybody, it's John Hall, senior editor of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. We're in Nashville and we're sitting at Yazoo Brewing Company right now. It is the Craft Brewers Conference Week and... 14,000 registered attendees have descended on the city, and most of the time they're, uh, they're hanging out here. And if they are here, they're probably drinking beers made by my guest today, Brandon Jones, master of the funk, uh, barrel man extraordinaire, uh, home brewer turned GABF winner, uh, Emmy-winning television producer, and all-around nice guy. Brandon, thanks so much for sitting back down on the show. Esquire. No. Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, John. That's uh, yeah, Bill S. Preston. Is that uh, yeah, is that where you're going right. with that? Um, <laughs> talk to me just a little bit about Nashville. It, it, it's people will be able to read about the the city in an upcoming issue of the magazine. But um, I've known you for a bunch of years. I've been coming down here for years, and the beer scene has changed tremendously. And so, since uh, you're my only guest as uh, a, a resident of the city, can can you sort of explain where we're at? with the city beer scene right now? I mean, like you said, it, it's definitely changed a lot in the past, uh, gosh, even since uh, 2012 when I started, when I went pro. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has, we've seen, we've seen new breweries open up three or four a year now. Uh, different parts of the city now have a neighborhood brewery. Uh, we have seen a big increase in people that are coming to seek our uh, beers like uh, the ETF line of beers now. That's so I think it's the funk. A, yeah, the embrace the funk, the sours, the wilds, the barrel aged, the funky. Um, people are uh, locals are seeking those beers out now, and uh, it's uh, it's a really amazing thing to watch this city kind of come up. I mean, we always have had a very great food culture here. Uh, our whiskey and, and uh, you know, being this close to Kentucky, bourbon. So I feel like we've always had a really nice kind of spirits um, type of uh, atmosphere in the city. Yeah. But it's nice to see that the beer scene in the past five, six years, especially in the past maybe two years, has just exploded. And in a, and in a great way. Because, I mean, I like drinking beer. And I like going to other parts of the city. So there are parts of the city with new restaurants you get to go to, and you could go to the other uh, other little brew pubs and uh, and little breweries. And it's increasing the competitive edge, right? I mean, I, I I've been coming down here. I have family here, so I've been coming down for 17, 20 years or so now. And I remember when Yazoo opened up in two thousand three, and it was sort of this really cool thing. Like, wow, there's a brewery in uh, in, in the city, and uh, it's in the old uh, it's an old tire factory well, where yeah, the old, uh, is now. Marathon, and, yeah, yeah, they make cars. Okay, for a few years. Yeah, um, yeah, but like, but you know, and now they're in this space. Uh, you guys are in this space, and now you're moving to a new space as well. Yeah, um, because there is this demand, but. Do you find that the beers that you're making, that the beers that are coming out of the brewery these days, um, that you have to be continuously on top of things? Like, you guys are the largest player in town, but mm -hmm. there's so many people nipping at your heels uh, these days. Sure. I mean, I guess there's always the saying, uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we've always tried to be on the forefront of innovation and uh, making interesting uh, beers for people just to come and enjoy uh, in, a, in a great setting. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Marathon Building, which yeah. was its own unique tap room. Uh, the tap room here in this area in the Gulch we're at now is its own unique experience. And then when we move to the new facility, um, that's going to definitely be its own destination unique area. And so pushing things forward, though, um, what year did Embrace the Funk open up uh, as part of Yazoo? Uh, that was in 2012. Okay. Um, so Linus and I had uh, brewed, actually the, the very first beer that we ever brewed together was in 2009. And that was at Marathon. And it was a red IPA of all things. Uh, the <laughs> and so I'd kind of just... Did you filter it? Uh, no, we did not. Oh, look at you guys yeah. are ahead of the head of the curve. It was uh, the good thing about our house use is it flocks out, so it almost looks filtered sometimes. But uh, that was a great beer. That was uh, called Brandon's Hot Blaster. Um, I was going to make a pilot batch of it and bring it back uh, this year, and uh, then we changed our winter seasonal to a red IPA. So I just kind of nixed that idea a little bit. 
And so you did this, uh, you, the first beer that you brewed with Linus Hall, founder of Yazoo, yeah. uh, H-A-L-L, I need to point out. But uh, he, um, you were still a home brewer at this point. Mm-hmm. And so, but you were getting more and more into... Yeah, I was definitely right? trying to push that. Uh, so I started making uh, Sours and Wilds uh, back in the mid, or mid early 2000s. Um, I just, I, I had a bottle of Leap and Zudenbahn one time, and that just absolutely was my epiphany moment. And those characters, those flavors, I wanted to recreate. I didn't even know, you know, much like anybody else probably in, in Tennessee, I, I didn't know what a sour beer was. I'd never heard of a sour beer. And so those, that bright acidity to it, that plum, that fig character, it was just like the most amazing layered complexity thing that I'd ever had. And so I was just, I was just hell bent on trying to find anything I could out uh, about these styles. And Michael Jackson had, uh, you know, he had written some books. Uh, Charlie Papazian had, you know, a few little things here and there. Uh, but there just was no information out there. So I just decided to start cataloging and speaking to as many brewers as I could. And thankfully, they were very excited about their projects because even the projects at Russian River and Lost Abbey, those were all in their infancy yeah. uh, in that time. And nobody was asking those questions. Everybody was still talking about the IBU race at that time or who could make the biggest uh, you know, 18% stout. So they did have these other projects these breweries were passionate about. And I just felt like I was kind of like at the right time to help capture that passion and all the, uh, you know, all the just super cool things that those guys were doing, yeah. that they were pioneering this whole, this whole movement of uh, wild and sour and funky beer. So, yeah, the website, we uh, you know, did a bunch of interviews for that, got a lot of info, cataloged. And you're brewing while you're doing this. Yeah, I, well, I was still home brewing. Yeah, at that no, that's point. what I mean. Like yeah, you were home yeah. brewing like, while you're doing this. So you're yeah. talking to... Yeah, it was very selfish of me because I didn't, <laughs> you know, there just wasn't that info. So I thought, well, you know, I don't know how to do all this stuff. So I, you know, I really just want to learn. And who better to learn from than, the, than those pioneers? And so I'm very, I mean, I'm still to this day super grateful of what they, of, of what guys like Vinny and Tommy and Lauren Siles or Lauren Limbach did for me, um, that, you know, they gave me that opportunity to learn. And I just always feel like I kind of learned from, you know, the greatest, the greatest around. And I felt very fortunate to, uh, to be able to ask the questions that, that troubled me about how to make these beers and the process and also to kind of calm my nerves on it. You know, we did some uh, interviews on how beer gets sick. And I had a beer that was just super soapy and, you know, I didn't quite know. And I talked to, uh, I just talked to a few brewers about it. And uh, uh, Jean-Manuel Cantillon said, uh, beer must be sick to be better. And that made me, that absolutely just made me never worry about a ropey or sick beer again. I've, I've, I've carried that with me for, you know, eight, nine years now. That little that little thought from him. And, and. And that's really sort of one of the, the I want to get into the nature of, uh, you know, uh, sour, wild, you know, funky in a little bit, because there's so much disinformation out there. there there's there's, oh, there's yes. a lot of folks who you know, think they know what it is, but it's, it, it's so much more complicated than a sound bite or so much more complicated than bottle label copy or an Instagram post mm-hmm. or, or, or anything else. And so... When you when you think about some of that early practical advice that you got, was, was were there other things that sort of came up that you embraced, as it were, or that you know that that sort of like helped you? Yeah, I mean, there were so the one of the biggest uh, misconceptions, and I used to read this a lot on the homebrew uh, forums and the boards, where people would say that the Britannomyces yeast is the one that's creating all the acidity and sourness in in the beers, and then the beers that that were, I mean, so that's, you know, we know now and that's, you know, kind of spread. I, I feel like that's more or less been dispelled. I mean, yeah. you still see it pop or you still see it and, and hear it occasionally, but I don't, you know, even five years ago, I would have heard it a lot more. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we had a beer we actually called Brett Not Sour and it was an IPA. <laughs> and I just wanted to make people say those words. So it was little things like that, just a little education type thing. So I felt like if we made that beer and uh, they had to say the words Brett Not Sour, then they would know that Britannomyces can create all these amazing you know, uh, pineapple, tropical characters with cherry and, and leather. But, you know, and it will create some acidity. But, you know, when we talk about sour beer, you know, we know that that's the bacteria yeah. that's creating that. So, 
you know, just I guess things like that uh, that I felt like have have kind of uh, dispelled, been dispelled. But but have they been dispelled though? Because as as new drinkers come on all the mm-hmm. time and people are flocking towards funky wild sour um, more and more because they think it's a badge of honor because they think that they need to choke you know something down because they need to you know it, 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 there, there's so much misinformation about mm-hmm. um, some of the beers that are out there but new people come on all the time are we as a consumer base from what from what you're seeing are we doing enough to educate the new people who came on like we've taken the time to educate ourselves mm-hmm. hopefully uh, the folks who listen to this podcast who read the magazine who, who drink your beer and listen to uh, to what you have to say and go to, to your blog as well um, are we doing enough to change the conversation for the new generation coming in? Well, I think that one thing that has just happened in the past uh, you know, six months is I'm one of the founding board members of the Sour Wild Ale Guild. Um, and so I think between our group helping one of our big, one of our big components you know, is obviously the advancement of sour and wild beer, um, but one of our biggest things is education. So educating our fellow peers in the industry not necessarily just going out and saying, no, you're, you're absolutely not so going out and saying, you know, no, that's not right. You shouldn't do it this way. It's, it's not that. It's simply presenting information based on things that brewers like myself or, um, or Jay Goodwin um, or Josh from Central State, uh, any of those folks that are, um, you know, that are willing to, to uh, just to help further the education in the industry. And hopefully, if we further the education in the industry, then that will translate into the tap room or tap, you know, or the bottle labels, uh, and just you know, create a, you know, create a just a bigger environment for people to grasp that knowledge. Now, we do have a good resource. Milk the Funk is mm-hmm. a great Wikipedia site. Yeah, yeah. For you know, basically, I mean, it's all peer review, not all peer review, but a lot of it's peer reviewed. Uh, and it's a plethora of information that breweries, I've, I've had so many breweries say, we get an amazing amount of info out there. That has absolutely changed our process. It's really helped us out a lot. I mean, I, I can say that as a, as a member of the Facebook group, um, which I, pretty much anybody can join, mm-hmm. that, I, I imagine. Uh, I've learned so much in the last couple of years based on that, um, uh, as being part of that group. But what I find really <coughs> interesting about your sour, your sour and Wild Ale Guild um, is that you immediately went to peers because that's where it has to start, right? It has to come from the brewers oh, yeah. to educate the consumers. It, it, so, because otherwise, if we're just shouting at the consumers, it's just we're, we're screaming into the into the wind, um, as it were. Mm-hmm. Are you finding? I'm sure that there's two schools of brewers, right? Where the ones who are like eager to learn, and then the others who are just like it's sours. How hard can it be? Because they're so used to quick kettle sours. They're so used to. Um, you know, quick turnarounds or just like you know, nature's miracle. Let's see what happens, kind of thing. Where's the frustration lie I, on that? I actually, you know, I don't think there's any real frustration. Okay. Uh, at least from from my viewpoint, um, there it's you know that's I, I see that there's room for improvements out there and how we uh, and how we present these styles and and how we you know how they're marketed, how we train the tap room staffs. Um, but again, we're not. I, you know, I'm certainly not the person to walk into your tap room and tell you how to run your tap room or your brewery. Sure. But we can present, you know, we can prevent science-based evidence on how these beers, how these beers are made, and we can also talk and we can have that discussion, like you said in that group, the healthy discussions on how these beers are termed. Uh, you know, the, even the difference between like Solera blending or Solera style and perpetual blending. You know that's kind of a little, you know, a little bit of a hot topic because, and even myself, I have, I've, I've said myself that some of our beers uh, we've done Solera, but you know, really Solera is moving the, you know, the spirit or the beer from one barrel and keep moving it down. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of term that as what we were doing for some of our fooders and stuff and uh, punchins that we don't ever empty, but it's a perpetual blend. Um, so I, I feel like things like that might, um, you know. Those would be, you know, good examples of things that would um, would be naming that we can talk about to absolutely do better things for the consumers. All right, so we've talked about sour. Um, I want to talk about wild with you for a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had conversations in the past. You were on the old podcast when I was at the old place, um, and we've had other conversations. Um, 
in emails on in person. Um, the word wild has been neutered, maybe, when it comes to beer. Um, and especially with uh, Britannomyces, um, where people just refer to it as wild. And, and, and I'm, I'm sort of setting you up in, in a way, because we, we've had this conversation where yeah. if you're buying uh, a smack pack from a, a yeast provider, uh, that's, that's a Brett strain. Mm-hmm. Um, is that truly wild because it's been cultivated uh, in a lab and... You know, a thousand other people can get that that strain yeah. at any uh, on demand. Like you know, it's the Amazon, uh, Amazon for yeast, as it as, sure. as, as it were. So, wild. How, how should we actually be thinking about wild beer these days? Well, we had this. So we so we had a little bit of a discussion uh, this past weekend at our uh, Funk Fest festival um, when myself and some of the uh, guild members were up there. And uh, just during the Q and A, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, what is, you know, what is wild? Yeah. And I've, I've, I'm kind of with uh, Jeff Stuffings, and I kind of had the Jester same, King. Yeah, yeah, Jeff from uh, Jester King. We kind of had the same uh, idea on what wild was, and clearly Jester King does a lot of, uh, you know, 100 percent spontaneous beer. Um, so our, you know, yeah, we definitely had this different uh, opinion or the same opinion, but I feel like we've sort of backed off on it a little bit because yeah, I still in my mind, wild is ambient microbes being, you know, naturally occurring in the beer. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you start looking at what some of these Britannomyces do, um, it, they, (laughs) they do do some wild things. Okay. So, yeah, well, I still agree with the sentiment of, you know, if you bought, you know, if you bought, a, you know, some uh, Brett Buxalensis and you put it in there and you said, well, this is our wild something. I, I still probably, you know, in my mind go, eh, that's not really. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was grown, man. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if I'd take quite as hard of a line with it anymore. I'm not, I guess maybe it just doesn't bother me as much anymore. Uh, but I do, you know, I do kind of think that the wild, you know, the wild, the name wild does get thrown around almost like the word Lambic does. Sure. Um, you guys installed a cool ship a couple of years ago, two years ago, thereabouts. Yeah, and, two uh, seasons ago. Are you noticing a difference then between those beers? Like uh, the between ones that, the two seasons? Yeah, we, or between the two seasons, but also, um, like... We're seeing so many more cool ships come online because of, and I, I, I don't often use the word, but the unique flavors that you can actually get from uh, true spontaneous fermenta- sure. uh, fermentation. Um, we've seen great progress with lab yeast, as it were. Like, but are, do you see a difference between the two? Like, is there side by side the huge noticeable difference? In like lab, the the, lab, the spontaneous versus the yeah. lab. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean that. There, you you cannot. Yeah, I, I, you just can't fake 100% spontaneous. Uh, there is a character there that I have tasted in the Degard beers and the Jester King beers and the Allagash beers and Iron beers uh, in the Black Project beers. There is a character there that I have never in my life tasted in any lab-grown, uh, any lab-grown microbes. Uh, and, it, and it's maybe it's the slow oxidation of the beer, the hyper attenuation. Um, you know, it, it, there's a combination. I mean, if anybody can ever crack the Lambic code or the spontaneous code and tell us exactly how to do it in the lab, I mean, they're going to be a billionaire. <laughs> but, you know, for now, it's still, it's just still one of those nature's mysteries as to, you know, that character. There is that character in, you know, in, in any, you know, even the, the, the real Lambics in, uh, in Belgium. I mean, yeah. there is still a, I still taste a common thread character in those. And I've never gotten that in in a in a lab grown beer. Even because we have taken our uh, cultures that we have done 100 percent uh, 100 spontaneous beers with, and we've used those cultures in other beers. And um, those cultures, I mean, while they still provide like a lot of like Nash, what I just always say is Nashville character. Um, it still <laughs> it doesn't Hot taste like regret. Parties and regret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> in a pedal tavern. Um, uh, yeah, this is, I should point that. out, this is the bachelorette capital of the U.S., right? You guys, I, have, uh, I believe it is now. I knew a couple of years Vegas, ago yeah. it was uh, it was us in Vegas and Miami, and I believe uh, Nashville, for uh, for better or for worse, uh, holds that uh, accolade. 
<laughs> um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, the, uh, the the yeast that we uh, that we've used that uh, that's come out of some of our uh, spontaneous batches uh, from we we did our first spontaneous beer in uh, 2012, and um, we've uh, we've reused those uh, microbes. I think they're pretty spread out in most of our barrels now, uh, with probably the exception of Deruges and yeah. uh, Zerbruin. Uh, they're definitely in our saison, um, but we've you know we've constantly used those just because they I think they make really dry uh, botanical floral beer, and I really like those. Um, but we have still yeah, I think even if we did a turbid mash, I've never done it, but just based on what I've tasted in other beers, I think even if we did the, the turbid mash and the three hour boil and the one pound uh, per barrel of uh, of aged hops, and we we pitched that. You know, that culture, I, I still don't, I don't know. I, I don't think it would be the same. Uh, I don't. I think it's just that slow, you know, the, the cell count's going to be so low anyway, going yeah. into the barrels, <clears throat> out of the cool ship. So I think that, you know, there's just something to that, that stressed growth, that slow growth, that long growth uh, throughout the years, and that, uh, that bit of oxidation that, that you get in there too. That doesn't, you know, it's not necessarily in a, you know, an acidic or acetic character. It's just... I just think that's a little amazing component in there that goes really well with age hops. But I, you know, I don't know. I don't think we. I just don't think we would get that same character. We'd get a nice character, sure. But it just wouldn't be the same. Yeah, it just wouldn't be the same. So I want to transition now to funky because that is. It's one of those things that's really tough to describe, and yeah. I and I find myself. It, it's sort of like pornography. You know it when you see it. Um, <laughs> What's your definition of funky in when it comes to beers? I kind of so uh, I've never had an you know an amazing like one sentence answer to this. It's well, kind of like a whole conversation this is a podcast, to so me. We can actually yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. What we're doing. So yeah. So we uh, so so funky to that's me. That's what the microphones are for. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're not just sitting here drinking beer, talking <laughs> at uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Drinking pilsner. Yep. Um, it's a damn fine breakfast beer. It's yeah. Good way to get the day started. Um, so <laughs> funky is uh, last night. Yeah. So funky to me, I, I like to use funky more than I probably do sour. Okay. Uh, when people people ask what you do, I say I typically say, "Oh, I make all the like funky," and I typically say funky first uh, because I think that you know sometimes that's again one of the things that even though that our name is the Sour Wild Ale Guild, I think. The just the term sour, we've we've so outgrown that. I mean, that's just like saying IPA yeah. when you have a you know how many categories are IPA now. Yeah. Um, so I, I like to use funky because um, I just feel like that kind of encompasses more of our our botanomyces and our character. We do have a house character, and I do think it tends to be a little bit more leathery and and cherry pie and uh, plum fig type character to it and hay. Uh, you know, to some of those, somebody said, you know, it smelled, it, it, I know what they were saying. They were trying to compliment it. They said, you know, it's almost got like this, like, dirt farm character. But they, I think they're too careful not to say, or they're trying not to say horse blanket. Because sure. um, just that, just, that's nails on a chalkboard to me, is horse blanket. I hate that. <laughs> um, I've never, I mean, I grew up in East Tennessee around a lot of horses. And actually, I still don't really know what a horse blanket smells like. So... Funky, though, to me, kind of strikes as it's more in the retronasal, it's more in the olfactory senses as opposed to actually on the palate itself. It's that sort of twinge yeah. that you get um, uh, when sniffing a beer uh, off of your nose. Like it's, it, there's, it's more on the aroma than it is even Yeah, on it's, the taste. it's that leather. It is. It's that leather um, wild. But it's this like, kind of sharp and kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I would absolutely agree with you. That that's you know that it does tend to be more as uh, uh, aroma sensory. Yeah. Uh, no, it definitely can be. We've got some brets that uh, that we use in our library that uh, definitely create like a massive like flavor funk in there. Yeah. But I would say that yeah, I would definitely refer to that more as like a aromatic. Should we even have a definition for it, though? I mean, I know I asked you to define it, but, like, it, it, it seems like it is one of these undefinable things. Yeah. And, 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 and are we at this point where... I'm sure you get the question all the time. I get this, you know, are, are, are sours or wilds, are they the next IPA? And it's like, no, they're, they're certainly not. Um, uh, but there are, there's a lot to explore, and there's a lot to 
um, uh, be creative with. Mm -hmm. We're at a point now where in the 10 or so years that, 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 that you've been doing this, uh, in the, the 15 to 20 that in some of the other U.S. established brewers that are doing this, the ones who are leading the charge, you know, that you mentioned, like Allagash, like Jester King, like, you know, which is only seven years old at this point. But um, we're, we're at this very infant stage. Are we boxing ourselves in too much right now um, by trying to have definitions, by trying to uh, uh, over-explain, or is it more time like do, do, do we just need to actually take some time and slow down a little bit and be like all right let's study this and let's look into this and let's uh see where things progress as opposed to what's the new beer release every saturday afternoon yeah like, it, it, we're at, I, it, it strikes me as like we're at this really weird crossroads. No, right I, be, now. I believe we are because and that's one of the reasons why uh the group of us um decided that we thought a guild would be helpful. Yeah. So we could have these discussions. We could bring everybody in the fold. These folks that are doing uh, kettle sours that are you know, basically three percent Berliner Weisses and, and fruit them like crazy. Yeah. And then we've got the you know on the other end of the spectrum, you do have breweries like Jester King that are doing an, you know an amazing amount of uh, spontaneous beers. And you got the folks in between. So yeah, there's plenty of there's plenty of conversation to be had. Uh, yeah, we, I think we we are at a crossroads, uh, but I think that we are at that crossroads where we do need to have these discussions, uh, and they do need to be open, and they do need to uh, you know be positive, and you know it doesn't have to be a debate, uh, you know a, you know back and forth, you know debate debate debate. It can be a conversation. It's a conversation, and nobody is uh, you know I don't think I, you know, I speak for myself, and I think I speak for the guild, and uh, you know none of us are out there trying to go nope this is this is it fits into this square right here and if you don't do it you know you're not part of the cool kids club you know or anything like that and we're definitely not cool kids yeah i was gonna say i was gonna say we have to try to sneak that in but yeah we we all know better um (laughs) as as we start to ramp up here um i've been asking folks recently what's your hope for beer that it uh for for beer in general just sour funky wild take, take it how you want yeah just uh my hope is that it becomes, you know, that it that it reaches in restaurants at least. Um, one of the things that I, I look in I look in Nashville and there's these restaurants with these amazingly curated wine lists and whiskey lists, and then it's just like, oh, there's beer, you know, and beer is just so with food. It's just it's the best beverage with food. Yeah, and. I would I, I would encourage the, the the restaurant owners and I would encourage people to look at their uh, vintage you know to look into having vintages. That is my hope is that beer is just more easily quality beer. It keeps continuing to be easily available. That is you know it, it's it's my livelihood. It's my passion. But I just I simply enjoy beer. Brandon Jones, master of the funk. Barrel man extraordinaire here at Yazoo Brewing in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, thanks so much for sitting down. This is always a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, hanging oh, out man, with you. I love talking to you. You have like well, a, you have a big list of things. <laughs> get it's you always do. a lot of fun. I don't have business cards, but I want you to do my business cards. It's uh, <laughs> when uh, an eight by ten. If <laughs> Lightery gets you everywhere with me, man, especially after two Pilsners this morning. Uh, and of Rodenbach Alexander from a previous pro, uh, yep. podcast. Um, if you want to learn more about great beer like uh, what Brandon makes, you should definitely check out our website and our magazine by going to beerandbrewing.com. There you can subscribe to the print version of the magazine, and uh, you can certainly read great news stories uh, all throughout, uh, as well as reviews. If you have questions for me, you can reach out uh, directly at John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L, at beerandbrewing.com, or join the conversation at Twitter at John underscore Hall. We'll be back again next week with a brand new episode. In the meantime, Brandon, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, cheers, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. This podcast is sponsored by the sour beer drinking folks at Fooder Crafters. They make fooders specifically for breweries and love every brewer they have ever met. Fooder Crafters would like to say thank you to all the good people in this industry. Cheers! This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.